Four days before my inauguration as president of Ecuador, I was going to the airport of Quito to fly with the president of Ecuador, Fabian Alarcón, to Bogotá to attend the inauguration of President Andrés Pastrana. My cell phone rang and I saw in the screen it was Minister of Defense. So I took the call and the minister said, Mr. President, the high commanders of the armed forces asked respectfully for an urgent meeting with you. I said, okay, I will come back from Colombia tomorrow, so let's have a meeting there. And he said, I'm so sorry, President, but this is very urgent, this is very delicate, very sensitive, is related to national security. The Ecuadorian intelligence have discovered Peruvian plans to invade our country four days after my inauguration. The war was imminent. This conflict has been very, very important. Actually, the oldest international conflict in the hemisphere because it started in colonial times. It started with the discovery of the Amazon River in 1542. So what we had was a territorial dispute, a borderline dispute, because there was a piece of land that at one point in time became bigger than France, was the bigger territory disputed in the Americas, and one of the biggest in the world. A war is a very expensive endeavor. It costs a lot of money. Ecuador has been spending 3.5% of its GDP for preparing for war during many years. And as our economy is much smaller than the Peruvian economy, for us that was a lot of money. Peru is five times bigger than Ecuador, as the double of the population. So Peru had six times more money on reserves in the central bank than Ecuador. And that money you can use to buy weaponry. So we were in a very disadvantageous situation from an economic point of view. And we have had two armed conflicts, one in 1981, we call that the Pakisha War, and one in 1995, we call that the Tiwinza War. After the Tiwinza War, we started negotiations with the four guarantors of the Rio Protocol, with the assistance of the United States, Brazil, Argentina, and Chile. In my presidential inauguration address, I invited President Fujimori to go to a negotiation table and to find a way to sign a definitive peace treaty. El Ecuador cree en la paz, pero la paz no es un acto, la paz es un proceso. Requiere de apertura, de capacidad de diálogo, de mutua comprensión de dificultades y problemas. The response came from the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Peru saying, the president of Ecuador is so young that he doesn't know that there's nothing to negotiate here because Everything was settled in Rio de Janeiro in 1942 when we signed the peace treaty that we called the Rio Protocol. So this attempt to meet President Fujimori was frustrated in Colombia. He didn't come. He didn't come to my inauguration. But President Fujimori paid attention to my words. And he ordered the military not to move until we could have our first meeting. So in August 13, three days after I started as president, I received a call from President Fernando Enrique Cardoso of Brazil, saying Fujimori is coming to Brasilia. We are going tomorrow to Paraguay to the inauguration of President Cubas. Why don't you come so you will have the chance to talk over there? Finally, we managed to get an invitation from four countries, we call the guarantor countries, because they guaranteed the Rio Protocol. The big, big countries of the Americas, the United States, Brazil, Argentina, and Chile. And they said to both presidents, we invite you to have a meeting in Asunción del Paraguay. So I went there, we had there our first meeting. Thank God we have a good personal click, a good rapport between President Fujimori and myself and uh, we started a conversation that lasted 10 weeks when we were stuck 
because I couldn't give the land to him, he couldn't give the land to me. And that was a dead end, and the clock was ticking. So at that point in time, I proposed to go to the guarantors and get their formula. a la conclusión de que no llegábamos a, 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 a enlazar las cosas. ¿no? Eh, entonces eh, fuimos a, a conversar con el, el presidente Fujimori, el presidente Fujimori lo escuchó todo y nos dijo, no se preocupen, las cosas no se hacen en una sola vez, poco a poco, y vamos a ir llevando, llegando al asunto. Un, dos, tres, They separated two concepts that usually come together, the concept of sovereignty and the concept of property. I mean, if you go to the Italian embassy in Washington, the moment you enter, you are in Italian territory. And the property of the building belongs to the Italian government. So the two concepts come together. In this case, we separated the concept of sovereignty over Tiwinza that belonged to Peru. But inside that sovereign territory, the guarantors told the Congress of Peru, you should give to Ecuador one square kilometer around the winds that were there, and where our soldiers have been buried. So the sacredness of the place was respected, was given to Ecuador. So it was given to us in property, never could be taken back. Esto es típicamente un cementerio de guerra, entonces vamos a hacerlo y vamos a, a, a dejárselos a ustedes, ¿no? pero siempre con territorio nuestro. ¿no? Mira, me dijo, creo que ya estamos llegando al final. Tengo la impresión de que esto nos va a resolver el problema. A mí esta frase me, me gustó mucho, se me ha quedado marcada, no sé, porque claro, no, no me olvido de ella. No me acuerdo de él diciéndome todo eso al costado mío en la, en la mesa, ¿no? Bueno, terminamos de almorzar y todas estas cosas, me dijo, bueno, vamos a seguir pensando en todo esto, pero ya creo que por ahí hay una línea. You have a narrative one side and a counter narrative the other side. For each story there is a counter story. And when you try to impose your story on top of the other is the arms wrestling. The only real solution is to create a third story that would be able to encompass, to embrace the two stories inside this third story. Que estaba de ministro, ¿no es cierto?, dijo que él no estaba de acuerdo, que él rechazaba y que no debía ser. Entonces, los, los tres, las tres armas se juntaron nuevamente, hablaron entre ellos y después dijeron, ¿no? nosotros no entendemos bien lo que está planteando el ministro, porque nos parece muy raro que nosotros estamos hablando de paz, los militares, y el ministro está hablando de guerra. Entonces, bueno, ahí terminó la sesión y el ministro estaba muy fastidiado, me dijo al momento de salir que él renunciaba, este, y efectivamente el día siguiente que yo tenía que ir con el presidente eh, eh, a, a Estados Unidos para seguir discutiendo esas cosas, nos íbamos a encontrar con Maguata, ahora hay los dos, eh, él, él renunció en ese momento a ser ministro. Y entonces, una semana más tarde, me hicieron ministro a mí, ¿no es cierto? Y yo seguí la cosa ya como ministro. One of the bigger mistakes we made on negotiations is to treat the other as an enemy. Think about this. When you start a difficult negotiation, how do you sit usually? You sit on both sides of the table. You confront the other party. When you treat the other as a colleague, probably you sit next to him or her. And so you can see the same papers, you can see the same drawings, you can share the information. And the enemy is not the other. The enemy is the problem. We needed to find a common ground. At the end of the day, we were both presidents, we were both elected, we both had to deal with Congress, with the media, with opposition parties. We had a lot of common. We were human beings. We were divorced. We had our daughters, about the same age, acting as first ladies. So we found these elements of commonality that constitute the basis to build a working relationship. 
along these uh, meetings we had, you become friends with the other party. And that happened with President Fujimori. The trust in each other was increasing, and that allowed us to overcome many obstacles. At one point in time, maybe we were the most convinced that the peace was possible, and we have a lot of opposition in our own countries against ourselves. That was interesting as a dynamic situation. We had 10 consecutive meetings in 10 consecutive weeks, and uh, 77 days after I started my presidency, we signed a peace treaty in Brasilia, and uh, this has been a definitive peace treaty. Ecuador and Peru firmaron un acuerdo histórico. That was the end of the road, and uh, it is a really emotional, impressive ceremony. People were crying. I remember, I didn't, but I was very emotional in the situation. In that ceremony, President Cardoso, who played a very extraordinary role in this agreement, he was, I would say, the axis for our conversations. Brazil was the most important country in this story. He was very emotional, and he couldn't contain himself. It was very touching for President Frey, President Menem. We had the President Gaviria, the General Secretary of OAS at the time, and the President Clinton sent the National Security Advisor to that ceremony, and the Pope had sent a special representative. So it was a moment of eclosion, of happiness for everybody who was there. El Perú entero estaba contento con esto. El Perú entero le parecía que era una cosa que, 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 que teníamos que, que llegar a un acuerdo entre los dos países. We have a lot of tourism between the countries. You can cross the border very easily. Uh, the goods that Peru sell to Ecuador have multiplied by four. The goods that Ecuador sells to Peru have multiplied by seven. Since then, 700% of increase. We have binational projects, we have irrigation, hydroelectricity, uh, schools that we can share, health centers, roads, everything is really, really good. Entonces vivimos bien, vivimos contentos, y yo creo que eso es algo que vale la pena. ¿no? So we felt like brothers, and that has been continued during the years. Many different situations in Ecuador and Peru. We have had coup d'etats, presidents removed, new governments. Nobody has dared to touch the peace treaty. Actually, we were nominated to the Nobel Peace Prize because of this with President Fujimori. President Clinton said, quote unquote, you have resolved the oldest source of international armed conflict in this hemisphere.